pathological collaboration were buzzwords at last year's symposium. And not just at symposium. Collaborative approaches to solving big problems are something that we're hearing about more and more. People are beginning to realize that when you're looking at climate change or hunger, these issues are systemic, they're shared, and they're bigger than any one organization can tackle alone. So in business, collaborations are often called pre-competitive collaborations. It's companies getting together and trying to solve some shared issues. Like, for example, you may have heard in cocoa, uh, the cocoa industry has come together to address child labor and forced labor and plant disease in their producing regions. Uh, apparel companies have come together to address uh, pollutants that come from factories that they all source from. So those are examples of pre-competitive collaborations, and I'm here to talk to you about and share a little bit about a new collaboration in coffee called the Coffee Lands Food Security Coalition. And um, specifically, I want to talk with you a little bit about how this came to be and one project that we have undertaken together and launched, and then another much broader approach to collaboration that I want to share with you today. It's called collective impact. It's a model for structuring collaboration in a way that can really make a difference and get results and involve multiple sectors, the private sector, nonprofits, government, foundations, to come together around an issue and get results faster. So, seasonal hunger. A few years ago, in 2010 at Symposium, the industry learned a lot about seasonal hunger for the first time. Now, this, is, this issue is not new. It may have been new to us, but within the development community, it's a well-known phenomenon among smallholder farmers, including smallholder coffee farmers. But at 2010 Symposium, we heard from Rick Pizer of Green Mountain Coffee Roasters and Chris Bacon, who's a professor at uh, Santa Clara University. And both of them shared research that came from interviews with smallholder coffee farmers in which the farmers themselves stated that the biggest issue that they grappled with was hunger. And that, furthermore, that being part of a fair trade cooperative or getting paid more for their coffees was not enough to change that. We learned that this phenomenon is so common, it has a name called Los Meses Flacos, or the Thin Months. So this was a wake-up call. And that year, Rick Pizer went with a filmmaking crew to Central America to interview farmers, more importantly, to let them speak for themselves. And in 2011 at Symposium, a documentary premiered called After the Harvest. And I have some stills from that documentary that I'll play and I'll ask you to read to yourselves. So this documentary was a turning point for many. That same year, we heard from Merlin Presa of Protocoop in Nicaragua. She testified that many members of her cooperative do suffer from months of hunger every year. We also heard from Daniele Giovannucci of COSA, who helped put this issue in perspective for us. Um, hunger, on a global level, it's, it's often invisible. It doesn't look like famine. And seasonal hunger is common among hundreds of millions of smallholder farmers globally. But in coffee, we often refer to coffee farmers as our partners. And Daniele reminded us that if you had a business partner who came to you and told you that they suffered from months of hunger every year, would you not be interested in working with them to address that? Well, many people said yes and began to wonder how. You know, how do, we get to, how do we tackle an issue like hunger that, that, that's so big? And um, how do we do it, you know, recognizing that we need to, to work together on this? And so another idea was really born, and that's uh, 
you know, part of what started the Coffee Lands Food Security Coalition. Rick Pizer, again, and he's going to kill me for mentioning him so much, but he really is an integral part of the storyline here, uh, decided to reach out to a handful of companies and see, you know, hey, you want to you know, get together for a day and talk about this and see if there's something we might be able to do together. And so in February of 2012, five companies came together in Portland for a day, and that was Counterculture Coffee, uh, Coffee Bean International, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, Starbucks, and Sustainable Harvest. And the answer that day was yes. We would like to do something together to address this issue. Um, and we want to do something immediately. We want to do something to show that we mean action. We don't just want to talk about this. And so the idea that day was something pretty straightforward. The first thing to do to show that we mean business and also to test the waters of collaboration would be what's you know, one model for collaboration that's called collaborative funding. And this is straightforward, it's been done before, and it was what they decided to do. So basically just chipping in together and funding a food security project at Origin. A year after that meeting, that was in February 2012, so just a few months ago, uh, the project actually launched in Nicaragua. It's a three-year program, and it's in partnership with Mercy Corps and Aldea Global Ginotega in Nicaragua. And it took a very collaborative approach to on-the-ground implementation, so it focused on the multiple facets of food security, uh, what, what creates food security. It's about creating food secure and resilient communities. So it addressed certainly things like market gardens and, and, and gender equity and climate smart agriculture, but also links with local government and other things that can really improve the resiliency of, of, of the community. So this is important and we're really, we're excited about that and it's something that any, anyone can do. You know, feel free, imitate this. It'd be great to have more of these types of projects happening. Um, it's good to have, if this is something that you're interested in, collaborative funding, it's good to have a few things in mind. One is a very clear purpose. You know, why are we getting together? Why are we gathering companies together? Um, and anytime you speak of gathering companies together, lawyers want you to have a pre uh, um, antitrust compliance agreement. So if you do get together, I hope I've made the, the lawyers in the room happy by mentioning, it's good to have uh, an antitrust compliance agreement in, in place just so that you're kind of crossing the T's and dotting the I's. But most importantly, it's really important to have a sort of structured guided process for decision making and for the conversation so that the people who are coming together perhaps for the first time to address a shared issue can relax and focus on the issue and feel that they're part of a guided and structured process. So, so feel free to, to take this idea and run with it. Um, at the same time that we were working on this and launching it, we were really trying to consider what would make a bigger difference? Like, we're, we're excited about this effort, but it's one effort. And seasonal hunger is a, is a big issue, and it's a risk that's connected to a lot of different risks. And we also want to uh, not replicate or duplicate so many of the great other initiatives and projects that are going on in coffee. As we all know, specialty coffee has a long history of being engaged in social and environmental issues. So there are already so many great company initiatives and nonprofits and councils and committees uh, addressing many of these issues. There's a bit of an issue that comes up, however, that the problem really that arises in the, is in the lack of coordination among them. And this is not about coffee. I mean, this is everywhere. And it's how things have sort of been structured and designed. Funders typically look to find a solution from an organization. Like, I want to fund an organization that's going to give me a short-term solution, and we're going to hope that it's successful, and it will replicate and scale up. And that's great. What results, however, is you know, usually a lot of nonprofits working side by side or a lot of efforts that kind of are happening side by side, sometimes at odds with each other. And you know, in the United States, we have something like 1.4 million nonprofits. And what happens in the context of big shared issues is that it just takes a lot more resources to try to make any meaningful progress. But what's more, and what's really more important for coffee to keep in mind, is that there's no evidence that single initiatives can shift big systemic issues, like climate change, like Roya, like hunger. These require new ways of coming together. And they require the recognition that risk is interconnected. Risk is interconnected, 
but our responses are not. Risk is interconnected. We saw this yesterday, but I'm going to you know, build on this picture. I know that you spent a lot of time yesterday focused on, on Roya. And we know that Roya's spread has been facilitated in part by climate change. Broca, same thing, can be facilitated by climate change. Climate change has other impacts. Of course, extreme weather events are one. Every time there's a pest outbreak or an extreme weather event, yields go down. Farmers suffer. Some suffer more, some suffer less, but they suffer. And it causes a number of different other risks to emerge. You can look on one side, um, you know, when yields go down, and particularly in years of low prices, of course, there's some farmers who can't pay back lines of credit. In aggregate, that can have a big impact on banks and local finance systems. There can be a big ripple effect there, and we've seen that before. It's not surprising. We know that this can happen, of course. It, of course, has a supply disruption. So in terms of being able to source the type of coffee, the, the coffees that we need, there can be a big supply risk. There's also, of course, a household risk. I mean, we're talking about smallholder farmers and larger farmers too, but it has a big impact at the household and community level, and that can have a ripple effect. And of course, to put it in context, I want to refer back to uh, Rick Reinhardt's uh, presentation yesterday. When we're talking about smallholder farmers, especially coffee sources, what is it about? Approximately 75% of our coffee from Mesoamerica. And in Mesoamerica, about 75% of the farmers are smallholder farmers, representing about 50% of total supply. 50% of total supply are smallholder farmers, many, many, many of whom are vulnerable to seasonal hunger. But seasonal hunger, as someone reminded me, is it is a big problem, but it's a consequence of other problems. It's a consequence of the fact that smallholder farmers face uh, a, just a really high burden of risk. And when we look at how all those risks add up, it creates a lot of vulnerability that can you know, really rip, have a ripple effect up the supply chain as well. Um, also, it's having a big issue, it has a big relationship to seasonal, uh, to uh, the Roy outbreak has a big relationship to seasonal hunger. So in some regions already this year, the thin months are doubling from three to six months. And I just read, thanks to the, uh, Michael Sheridan's blog this morning, the CRS Coffee Lens blog forwarded a report from something called the early, Famine Early Warning Detection System, uh, funded by USAID, our tax, our tax dollars, that said, you know, this year farmers may be able to cope, um, it is going to be really difficult, but as you know from yesterday, the Roya issue is going to get worse and worse. It's going to compound in coming years. And so again, looking at the interconnectedness of risk, we're looking at potentially some big ripple effects. We don't know. I mean, we don't know, and I'm not trying to be a total Debbie Downer here, but, but it's, uh, it's, it doesn't look good. And so we want to see what meaningful action can we take? What are some ways to team up that could take action? And, and I just want to put this in context a little bit because we're also, we're not alone in this. Um, a video that, that I could refer you to that um, the World Economic Forum puts out a series of videos, one's called the Global Risk Report for 2013, which is one of my favorite videos right now, which shows you how much of a geek I am, but it really talks about global risk. And you know, climate change is a big one. We are facing an increasing frequency of extreme weather events, more vulnerability because of where people are and where coffee farms are, of course. Um, more of the burden being placed on government, but governments are increasingly in debt. So we've got an increasing need for financial resources to address risk, but a decreasing capacity to do so. And every time we respond to a risk, like Roya, it draws down our ability to respond to the next one. So isn't it time to back up a little bit and look at what type of investments and what type of collaborations could actually make a difference and build some resiliency into the communities that are supplying our coffee, into our business partners' communities. It requires leaders like you in this room and you in the conversation lounges uh, to think differently and be able to, I mean, there's a challenge here in balancing the need for short-term profitability 
and the short-term need for good coffee with the long-term perspectives on risk that the, that the sector is facing. And that is a challenge. It requires us to come together in new ways with other sectors, with government, with nonprofits, with foundations, with international organizations to really develop shared solutions. There are new models for collaboration emerging, and one of them is called collective impact, and that's what I want to share with you today. We saw this as potentially being really helpful in addressing seasonal hunger, and we actually think that addressing seasonal hunger, it's an interesting approach because when you look at seasonal hunger and you look at the interconnected risks, if you take on seasonal hunger, you're actually taking on multiple risks. You're taking on a multifaceted approach to building resiliency in, in supply communities. So what is collective impact? It is a way for the private sector, coffee companies or you know, any private sector community, to come together with government foundations, organizations, to align on a common agenda and get results faster. So what does it really look like potentially in coffee? So in coffee, we've got coffee companies um, that include, you know, you can, between here and producers and producer groups, really we're talking about the whole supply chain and global coffee community. Government, there's foundations, there's NGOs, and typically we work kind of near each other, we sometimes overlap. Um, but what Collective Impact does is it provides a structured framework for collaboration with five elements that are all equally important. One of those elements is a common agenda. So those are shared goals. And they're usually general, but specific enough that people can look at them and say, yeah, this, 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 this could make a difference. So some shared goals and a sense of how to make those happen. There's also shared measurement systems, so a, sh a report card that everybody's working from. So you actually know if individual efforts or collective efforts are making a difference. You can add them up, which is good. Mutually reinforcing activities. Collective impact isn't about sort of telling people what to do. It's about saying, you know, you do what you do well, you do what you do well, and let's see how they're all in service of these common goals. And maybe we can team up, maybe we need to do some joint efforts, that's great. And that requires usually continuous communication, which is one of the other elements. So a high degree of communication between the sectors, between the different actors. Um, so how does it actually get done? There are what are called backbone organizations. So these are, it's in people's job descriptions to make this happen. It's not a volunteer effort. A lot of well-intentioned volunteer efforts just don't go anywhere. So it is, this is, it becomes someone's job. And I want to be really clear, the backbone organizations take a lot of different forms. It's not about, Collective Impact is not about new organizations necessarily. It is about new ways of organizing ourselves and our efforts. So I want to give you a couple examples that can illustrate how this is applicable in different scenarios because it's being done, it has been done, and it gets results. So I want to give a, a local example, Somerville, Massachusetts, uh, you know, neighbor right here, give him a little shout out. They, there's a program there that's very local, um, but got great results called Shape Up Somerville. It was looking at an issue of childhood obesity, a negative health trend that you know, is, is an epidemic in the United States right now. They actually achieved a st statistically significant decrease in childhood obesity in a three-year period using a collective impact framework. So they had three general goals, and they were things like increase activity, decrease caloric consumption, and increase intake of healthy foods. So what those types of goals allowed for was that anyone in the community with any connection to those could take action and report on it. And that included the school lunch programs, parks, restaurants, but it also included the people who paint the crosswalks and do the sidewalks so that kids could walk to school. So that gives you an example of how different organizations can kind of be in service of shared goals. I want to give you an example from, the, from another end of the spectrum, global initiative called GAIN, which is the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. This is targeting one billion people globally. And the goal is to end malnutrition. They've so far reached about 600 million. And this, again, is an alliance between private sector, government, foundations, international organizations. And these are the types of results that they've gotten. So just, with, just within, uh, one of their strategies is, is fortification of, of basic foods. And just within that strategy and just within maternal and infant health, they achieved a 30% decrease in neural tu tube defects in um, South Africa, 
a 14% decrease in anemia in Western Kenya, and a 30% decrease in anemia in certain populations in China. So those are results, and that's why the companies that in the you know the current effort in the Coffee Land Food Security Coalition, you know, we're looking at this model and saying maybe maybe this could be a fit, maybe this could be a way that we could actually start structuring collaborations that make sense and coffee to ta tackle some of these really big issues. So what does it require? Because it does require, you know, it requires certain things. And, and one of them is certainly a shift in mindset on a number of levels. One of the shifts in mindset is, is among funders, which is to say, instead of going from, and NGOs, but instead of going to these like single projects and hoping that they work, really being willing to fund long-term projects that are really both about connective tissue, connecting up at, uh, collective efforts, and getting results. So that's a, it's a different model, and it requires everybody to be thinking a little bit differently in that regard. It would require in coffee that we really do come together and align on um, some, shared, some shared goals. And I actually, I mean, that's super tricky, but there's a lot of work that's already been done to look at what might actually made a dif make a difference. So there are solutions out there that we could draw from that, could, that could be really positive. Um, so where we are now the, in this effort is we're one month in to an exploratory research phase. So that may seem really early, but it's intentional. We're sharing it with you now because this is something that requires a lot of conversation and a lot of outreach. We want to have this be a collectively sourced initiative. And I've begun to have conversations with NGOs and companies, and um, you know, the feedback's really positive, but it takes a lot to make this happen. So if you are at all interested in this model, you want to learn more about it, if you're uh, you want to send a signal of support or be connected to it, or if you want to be integrally involved and help drive this action, we really want to talk with you. So you can talk with me, and I'll mention some names, and I know we don't all know each other, but I think it's really important to just mention some of the other companies that are connected to this. You know, you can talk to Dave Griswold, you can talk to Kim Elena, she's, she's connected to this, um, Sarah Bobian of CBI, Kelly Goodyjohn of Starbucks, Tracy Ging of um, S&D, and Rick Pizer, of course, are all people that you could ask if you happen to know them. But come find me on a break, come find me at lunch. We, we would all love to speak with you about it. The last thing I'll say is that this also re it requires a shift in mindset about leadership. Like, who are the leaders? Who's going to lead this? Because it doesn't look like you know, one person being able to take charge. Systemic issues aren't really, they're not cut out for that. We place unrealistic expectations on our leaders sometimes. And um, these unrealistic expectations, I don't know if you can show the slide. <laughs> they sometimes look a little bit like this. It's an unrealistic expectation to hope that anyone can come in, particularly on a unicorn, and fix a huge systemic issue. I want to give you an alternative idea, which is, um, you may have heard of Wael Gonim. He is the Egyptian Google executive who helped jumpstart the Egyptian Democratic Revolution. And he called it Revolution 2.0. No one's a hero. Everyone's a hero, no one's a hero. He likened it to Wikipedia, where there are thousands of anonymous authors. And that's kind of like collective impact. We need, we need many, many, many authors to affect the type of change that needs to happen to make a difference in our, in our, in our industry. And collective, act, collect, collective impact could be a model that would work. Um, it's worked elsewhere. It's getting results. It's totally possible. Thank you. <laughs>